when I first looked into combat robots in Australia, the types of machines that came up were featherweights. They're the biggest combat robots we compete with in Australia at 13.6 kilograms, with only a single arena in the country capable of safely containing them. I initially gunned toward building my own feather, but was sensibly directed towards much smaller ants and beetles by the builders. That was early 2020, and a full combat feather event hasn't happened since, but recently one was announced to be happening mid-January 2024. Having built up the skills and equipment to build at that level, I set about finally realising my initial goal of competing at the highest level with my very own Open Combat Featherweight. This being the first project I started after I made this channel, I'll be documenting the design, construction and competing of this machine and whatever comes after. First order of business is to decide what the machine will be conceptually. Back in 2020, I produced a lineage of feather concepts with my developing CAD skills all centered around a four-wheel drive controlling lifter. The final variant was very similar to another featherweight named Tormentor that used a front hinge, flipper and lifting wedge. While conceptually good, my version of this design had some pretty big flaws, so I decided to move away from it. This here is Derive, a recent airweight combat robot I built that has two distinct weapons. With both a lifter and a spinning disc, it can destabilize opponents control them around the arena and into the pit, as well as do damage with the disc and throw machines over the boundary wall for a quick knockout. Drive is a 150 gram robot built to test the dual weapon concept and prove successful by reaching the semi-finals of its first event with a 5-1 record. Now this is far removed from my goal of a featherweight, but making a scaled down concept is cost effective and allowed me to get a feel of the machine, namely if building and fighting it was enjoyable enough to invest in making a bigger version. I really like the new avenues the mix of weapons presented, so forge ahead with designing the bigger machine. First order of business was to specify some simple design guidelines. The obvious ones are four-wheel drive, as well as having a rear hinge lifter and vertical spinning weapon on the front. Ideally the machine will be manufactured by myself on my CNC milling machine and manual lathe, so no fancy geometries. Further on that, many featherweights are made of welded steel panels for a strong armoured chassis, but this doesn't line up well with my skill set. So CNC machined aluminium would be the go for structural elements with some separate armour solution. In order to make weight with two weapon systems, I'd use the most power dense electrical setup I know of, that being low speed electric skateboard motors. The motors themselves are not especially powerful for the weight, but make up for not needing as high of a gear reduction to power drive trains or other mechanisms compared to high speed motors. This means while I may use an extra 300 grams of motor in the drive train, I'd be saving 500 grams and a lot of money on the gearboxes. Therefore, the Featherweight Derive would be a four-wheel drive spinner lifter robot with a CNC machined aluminium chassis powered by skateboard motors on 12S batteries and VESC motor controllers. The machine that needed to be realized in CAD to pick components, design parts for machining, and ensure the robot would be within the 13.6 kilogram weight allowance. I start most of my models by bringing in a few dedicated parts and roughly positioning them in space to determine the layout of things to come. I wanted it to be aesthetically similar to the ant weight, so structuring things like that from the start is a good idea. Next is to form primitive frame components that fit the shapes and contours of the other parts. Machines assembled with fasteners instead of welding tend to look boxy, so some angularity was given to the frame to alleviate this. There is a sort of hierarchy that I model parts in, from top to bottom. Some dimensions are set in stone, like the size of motors and electronics, some are more lenient, like sprocket position. It can be any angle, but within some discrete multiple distance from each other to keep the chain tight. Others are almost completely variable, like frame rail shapes. 16mm thick and 80mm wide was as big as I can get for cheap, so for long parts, staying with that, anything went. Eventually, we've got a 60% model with the shapes and positions of everything pretty well defined. Around here, I decided the armour would involve thick, plastic pieces of HDPE mounted to shock absorbing hinges to absorb hits. It would be much safer bet to just put a big block of plastic between the side armour and frame, but the hinged armour seemed too cool to give up on. Inside we can see the layout of components, big motor and gearbox for rear for lifting, motors in the front for drive and spinner, vesks and batteries fill all remaining space. The fixed forks are mounted on big blocks of aluminium that also make up the front frame bulkhead if anything hits the machine. All grey components are made of a steel called Hardox, a high carbon alloy that is tempered and quenched to give a hard surface while still being relatively soft internally to prevent cracking. 
is most often used for excavator buckets, bullet traps, or reforming armoured vehicles. Quite heavy, but there's really nothing stronger I have access to, so the forks and spinning weapons will be made from it. Moving on to a 90% complete model, it's time to form each part for potential manufacture. I always want to consider each bolt hole, how long every fastener is, checking there are no internal radii on parts that will be hard for the machine, etc. Flathead screws hold plates down as can be countersunk out of the way from impact, as well as having a large contact area, which is good for sheet metal, which is quite thin. Button heads are fairly low profile and can glance hits, but the small hex in the head makes them a poor choice for torquing down parts, and get especially problematic at smaller sizes than metric 6. Socket head screws are used everywhere else for their large hex, making them easy to drive without stripping. Importantly, this machine uses all grade 12.9 steel fasteners, as these are considerably stronger than lower grade ones found in hardware stores. This means increased strength for identical mass, or lighter for the same strength in our case. If you're building a combat robot, it's a no-brainer to use functionally entirely grade 12.9 screws. At this point, I checked in with another builder and got a few suggestions for improvement. For one, my wheel axles were currently 8mm screws on a cantilever, far from adequate. Swapping them out for hollowed 20mm diameter aluminium posts has a massive bending strength advantage for very little extra weight. Despite the high quality bolt steel being considerably stronger than the aluminium, the resulting strength to failure was increased eightfold. Another change is doing away with the wheel bearings for a plain plastic bushing as a reduced friction wasn't worth the tiny bearings exploding and locking up. Later a big change came in restructuring of the drive powertrain. Instead of a gear reduction to a wheel and then a belt drive to the rear, both the wheels would be driven from a single belt from the motor, while getting the same reduction as the gears would have provided. This effectively just saves the weight and space that the gears would have used at the cost of redundancy if the belt is lost. Cars use a similar method in their engines to run many components off a single power source. It's called a serpentine belt. When it came time to purchase parts, the lifter gearbox was swapped out from a Rev Ultra Planetary to an Andy Mark Sim HD Sport due to exorbitant shipping costs from Rev to Australia for such a small order. The frame was adjusted to be entirely made out of 16mm plate, so no big chunks in the front anymore. I haven't said much about the weapon disc yet, as it's a pretty simple assembly. Two roller bearings supported radially, another pair for axial retainment, and all riding on a case hardened steel shaft. With parts on the way, and a completed model, it was time to actually start making things. Stock was purchased and picked up, so I set at work on my CNC mill. The CAD models can be turned into machine G-code instructions using the software's CAM package, with different programs for different tools in my case, as, I, as without a tool changer, I need to set the heights of each tool manually between cuts. Stock was loaded onto the bed and clamped down, and the tool position zeroed in on the control software, and tool height set using a piece of paper. From there it's just a matter of letting the machine run while occasionally cleaning up the chips.
Now there's considerably more to CNC machining than clamping apart and pressing go, but we'll probably cover that another time. One tip I will give is to actually tighten the clamps before milling. While the CNC runs, I found the time to turn the axles in the lathe. Being aluminium, it was all quite an easy job. Next up was the steel parts, which I got plasma cut out of 6mm hard ox. Plasma cutting is quite an incredible process for a few reasons. For one, the plasma blast is less like a laser and more like a vortex of energy. It cuts differently on each side due to the direction the vortex is turning into or away from the cut. Due to variations in height, a control box handles the power to the torch and monitors the voltage of the cut to check for a sudden jump in the plasma or general underperformance. Even with all that, the result on this machine is pretty poor cut compared to milling, with a lot of taper and goopy bits. But it blasted through all the metal in about 7 minutes for a job which have taken close to 10 hours on my milling machine. An angle grinder and a Dremel clean the parts up anyway. It just means one has to keep in mind the effects of the machine on cuts when designing. All my holes were loose fits, and no part needed high tolerance dimensions for example. An interesting thing to note is Hardox actually only comes in half millimetre increment thickness, so the 6mm plate was actually 5.5, and this is so you can easily tell if it's hard ox or just mild steel, which comes in whole number millimetre increments. Next, top plates were cut on my mill, and with the arrival of gearbox parts and the random bits from China, the machine could be assembled for motion. Temporarily I used Lego wheels on printed hubs to get the machine rolling. Bells wrapped nicely around all the pulleys, and soon enough the machine was on four wheels for the first time. Gave the Vesks a rough tune to get the motors turning and put it on the ground to drive on its own power. Oh no, lost a wheel. Tires are coming out. Aside from the tyre rolling off, it was a successful test. After temporarily swapping the wheels for cheap plastic caster hubs, some more driving showed more promise in the serpentine belt system. Previously one of the idlers had seized against the stainless post. Adding grease prevented this in the future. Stainless is especially prone to galling, so I should have seen this coming. The final scientific test was to load six times weight and see if the belt slipped. With the groundwork of being able to drive achieved, I moved on to the next step up in functionality, the lifter. Due to picking a 5045 motor, I needed a custom plate to attach the motor to the gearbox, which was knocked up on the CNC mill. I included two sets of mounting holes for the two different types of 5045s just in case. The pinion got pressed on in the vise and the gearbox assembled. Interestingly, the three stage planetary gearbox has the last stage use extra long gears. These see the greatest load, so it makes sense to skew material towards them. Other systems like the Versa Planetary or Ultra Planetary do not do this, so that's points in Bainbots and Andy Mark's favour. The lifting mechanism uses a pair of number 35 sprockets, which felt like a good size. I quickly noticed the chain I picked up did not fit despite having the same pitch and width. Turns out 06B chain has a different roller diameter to number 40, 35, so a number 35 chain can run on an 06B sprocket, but not vice versa. The lifter hub uses a few pieces of HDPE clamp between the Hardox lifter arms with a sprocket in between. One could be concerned of the bolt shearing under high loads, this is actually unlikely if assembled right. Due to the high clamping force of a properly tightened bolt, it should be the frictional force between the plastic pieces that transmit torque, not the fasteners. This is how one can get shear joints of greater strength than the fasteners that hold them together, and is very important when building bridges and aircraft, a concept called preload. To call the lifting power a success, I'd want to reliably toss 150% of the expected mass of an opponent to give some safety room. I've got a bag with 5 lead acid batteries in it, which weighs about 20 kilograms, so that was my target. The first lift brought it off the ground, uh, but the second go skipped the chain. Turns out the plates that the gearbox mounts to had flexed upwards. The 8 fastener mount I devised to hold the gearbox was excellent at reacting the twisting moment of lifting but not good enough for the radial load of the chain pulling the gearbox towards the lifter axle. This was pretty easily remedied with a block and a printed bushing. 
Now the radial force is reacted with two simple forces rather than a moment trying to twist the gearbox. Second attempt at the bat bag lift was a success and I was on to throwing a big rock around for a while and see if anything failed on repeated loads. Nothing did so I called it good enough for now. Worth noting that the batteries I were running were very old and worn out so I expected better performance out of the new packs which were on the way. Assembling the armour package was quite straightforward. Just a couple pieces machined on the mill and bolted together. Bending the HDPE to angles one sees were quite a bit of work. I had to stick one end of the part in a vise and blast it with heat while hanging my full weight off the end. It springs back to about half the angle it's held to, so I had to fold a complete 90 degrees to get the 45 desired. One can see the big air gap between the armour and the wheels. I consider it pretty crucial to be here, even if it goes against my desire for compact machines. I expect some of the large horizontal spinners to punch straight through the 20mm HDPE if they get a chance, so a gap is pretty good. Drive is now assembled to be driving, lifting and aligning with the CAD weight, meaning it's prime time to go ahead and get the spinner done and all the electronics packaged in properly. I'm going to Melbourne in a month, so some robot time will be dedicated to other machines like scale, split and subdivide ready for that event, but we'll continue to pot along with the drive. The full CAD file for Derive and all my other robots are available on GradCAD if you want to have a closer look at the machine's design or base your own machine on my robots. I'll be casting the custom wheels and having a working spinner for the next Derive video, so keep an eye out for that. Until next time.